There are hundreds of other videos on what programming language to learn and where to learn to code. This is not one of those videos. We're gonna assume you already know that, skip all of it, and I'm gonna give you a four part roadmap to actually landing a full-time coding job. So you know what you're getting into, here's the four parts, feel free to skip ahead. Part one is knowing when you're ready, aka auditing your existing coding skills that you've spent the time learning. Part two is crafting your virtual presence. This means resume, portfolio, LinkedIn, and other stuff like that. Part three is the interview. This is the big one and the most important part. So if you watch just one, watch part three. Number four is the follow through, which includes everything from mindset to negotiating offers to getting multiple offers and how to deal with that. Aaron Jack here from Freemo, by the way. We've seen the mistakes thousands of new programmers make in our bootcamp and we wanna help you avoid them. So if that sounds good, consider subscribing. Okay, let's get into part one, which is knowing when you're ready to apply for a job. Here is a checklist for knowing if you're ready to start applying or not. Checkbox number one, have you built a portfolio of personal projects, either on a personal website or on GitHub, ideally on both. As for what qualifies as a personal project, rule of thumb I use is, is the code majority yours? Meaning you can start with someone else's project, whether that's from a tutorial or an existing repo, but have you changed it enough to make it unique? I did exactly this for my old portfolio website, AaronJP.com, followed a Udemy CSS tutorial, and then changed it so it looked uniquely mine. Checkbox number two, can you solve basic Code Wars problems for your language of choice? Code Wars is the best site for beginner level coding problems, because these are similar to the type of questions you're gonna get in an interview. And they're also a way to test your mastery of both logic and the syntax of your language. Okay, now number three, this is the one a lot of people skip. Do you know the meta skills for your language? Meta skills mean if you learn JavaScript, you can't get a job with just that. In most cases, you need HTML, CSS, and React because there are no jobs hiring JavaScript developers, but there are a lot of jobs hiring front-end developers, which is that whole package. Different example, if you chose Python, you're gonna need databases, some backend systems knowledge, and probably at least one framework like Flask or Django. So how do you know what is the full set of meta skills? Well, maybe it's obvious, but just look at job posts, search for front-end developer, and see what set of skills you need for most jobs. Rule of thumb, if you meet more than 60% of the requirements, you can apply for that job. And that 60% applies to years of experience too. If it says one to two years of experience, that's pretty much as close as you're gonna get to a junior front-end developer, so just go for it. All right, we're on to section number two, crafting your virtual presence. Because you're not literally knocking on doors to get a job, you have to represent yourself in the virtual world in a way that's appealing to employers. Let's start with resume because I've seen some absolutely terrible resumes in my day. Could be its own video, so I've left a resume template in the description for you. But anyway, we'll run through the key points right now and I'll put it on the screen. Long story short, even if you're new to this stuff, you want your resume to look like you're a developer. And I don't mean lie, I mean format it in that way where the hierarchy, meaning the sections that take up the most space are about your coding. Even if you had a different career for 10 years, you want to de-emphasize that unrelated experience and emphasize your new skills, new projects, and so on by having them take up more space. That's basically the long and short of it. Now, what about that personal website? And is having GitHub alone and some green squares enough? Here's what I'd say, bear in mind who's looking at your profile. It's not always gonna be other developers. In fact, for bigger companies, often gonna be recruiters who don't necessarily know what they're looking at on GitHub. So even if you're back end only, having a beautiful looking personal website is really the way to go. And you don't have to build it from scratch. You can use a website builder like Webflow to spin one up in a few hours. As for LinkedIn, which could be another whole video, main question is, do you need it or not? I would say 100% yes, especially because it's also not too hard to create and you can use it to cold message recruiters, reach out to people you knew in your past who might be able to refer you to jobs. And when someone Googles for your name, they'll find your LinkedIn. All right, we're on to the good stuff. Part number three, the interview. So the first thing you wanna do is search on Glassdoor and read the experiences of other people interviewing for your same role at that company. So if I had an interview in Facebook, I would search for Facebook Glassdoor software engineer interviews. And people will leave interview experiences, even explaining what specific questions they got. Now this is important because you don't wanna over or under prepare. Because in contrast to Facebook, which would be a really hard algorithm style interview, a lot of front end jobs out there will literally just test your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript knowledge with basic problems or even just building a practice project and that'll be the whole interview. Realistically though, across the board, you can expect three things, which is them asking about your past projects, a few simple coding challenges, and some system design or planning style questions. So in terms of talking about your projects, yes, you did build them, but you should practice talking about them out loud. And I know that sounds dumb, but you will sound dumb if you don't do this. Trust me. 
What's gonna happen is you're either gonna make it too short or you're gonna ramble for too long. And you also wanna create a compelling story so people don't get bored. Here's an example. So if one of my projects is a Tinder clone, but the difference is I always get a match, then I might even make a joke out of it and say, okay, for this project, you know, I was on Tinder and you know what the most annoying part is? You never get matches. So this app was gonna fix that, but just for me. And then I would go on to explain kind of how I built it, some of the challenges I ran into and so forth. And I would go through that chronologically. So I would say, okay, here was the high level architecture. I looked at these other sites to get design inspiration. And then while I was implementing it, these are the challenges I ran into. Just so the development seems very intentional and like you know what you're doing. The personal project section is often neglected by people they don't spend time preparing for it but this can actually leave the longest lasting impression and it's the most low-hanging fruit so definitely practice your pitch of your project okay let's talk about coding challenges now and my main warning here not to get overwhelmed with the amount of questions on a site like lead code which literally has thousands what i would say is master the data structures first the most common algorithms for each one and then beyond that don't stress too much of course more practice is going to help but i would say shoot for a lot closer to 50 or 100 than a couple hundred or a thousand. Now, of course, getting the right solution is important, but what matters even more is having a structured process, just like you explained your project. And to do that, just remember the acronym IOCE. Once you get the problem, always define what the inputs, outputs, constants, and edge cases are. Then you can step through the problem and your interviewer will be on board with your framework so they can jump in and help you. And to some degree, they are expecting you to get stuck depending on how difficult the question they give you is. Then don't forget to do the time and space analysis at the end. I have a big O video on my channel that's a bit older that you can check out if you wanna learn about that. Now, what about system design, which is really just a fancy word for practice planning. The best way to learn this is to watch example questions on YouTube. Just type in system design and you'll find a bunch and you'll start to notice the common threads. System design comes down to knowing a lot of stuff at a very high level, like databases, APIs, microservices, caching, these sort of mechanisms. They can discuss the trade-offs between. So for example, you might draw three different services and the APIs that connect between them, discuss trade-offs between NoSQL and SQL databases, and also recommend using a specific framework and its benefits to improve developer experience. What I'm saying now freaks you out, just watch a couple of these system design videos and they all start to sound very similar after a while. And you do not need to be an expert on this stuff at all to talk about it at a high level. That finally brings us to part four, the follow through things can go really well or really bad and to a large degree that's out of your control you can't choose who interviews you you can't choose who you're competing with for the role and maybe it's just straight up not a good fit with the other people on the team which kind of makes this whole thing just a mental battle of toughness and persistence here's what you can control though self-reflection i'd strongly encourage you to actually write down how you feel about every part of the interview right after you do it because you are gonna forget everything from parts of a question that you messed up, maybe you talked for too long about one of your projects, and maybe the vibe was just off with one or two of the interviewers, write it all down. And by the way, I forgot to congratulate you on getting that first interview because once you get one, you can always get more. You know you can do it anyway, so. Let's say you did get the offer though, how exactly do you play it? Do you immediately accept due to excitement? Probably not, you could be leaving money on the table. Offers are negotiable at almost all companies. You can usually get minimum 10%. And I would say to ask for up to 20% more, you're not gonna offend anyone. You might just get a salary counter offer. So for example, if you got an offer for 100, just ask for 120 and say you're flexible on how much of that gets applied to stock versus base salary. If you're curious about tech salaries, I also have a video on that, or you can check out the website levels.fyi to see salaries at different companies. That info is also on Glassdoor too. As you can see, Glassdoor is pretty freaking useful. If you get multiple offers, obviously that's the best. You can kind of play them against each other. And if you have another interview coming up that you really want to hear back from, the timelines can get a bit tricky. You can ask for more time to accept an offer, but just make sure you're letting them know at every step of the process and not leaving them hanging. Could create some resentment there. So those are my tips. Hope it was helpful. And like I said, our mission here is to help you avoid the mistakes that other new programmers make. That sounds good. Consider liking, consider subscribing. Good luck on the interviews. Hope to see you in the next one.